It's mysterious, it's deadly, and it's baffling medical science. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Once thought to affect only promiscuous homosexual males, AIDS is now spreading in epidemic proportions to other segments of the population. If uh, the trends continue as they are, I think we can predict that the acquired immune deficiency syndrome is a, is a highly fatal illness likely to remain with us uh, for the next decade. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. The disease has already claimed more victims than Legionnaire's disease and toxic shock syndrome combined. More than 800 cases nationwide, 300 plus of those fatal. And every day, three more cases are identified. And yet, still, surprisingly few people are familiar with the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or the acronym by which it's frequently identified, AIDS. The reason for that may lie, in part, in the character of its most common victims. When AIDS first cropped up about 18 months ago, almost all its victims were homosexual males. Alarming enough to that particular segment of society, but, so it first appeared, not threatening to the public at large. But that seems to be changing, and the disease may be spreading. Here's Nightline correspondent Betty Rollins. When AIDS was first discovered more than two years ago, it was sometimes called the gay plague. That's because virtually all of the victims were homosexual, and many of them wound up with a rare and often deadly form of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. Hi, hey, Bill. Hi. Hi, this is Roger McFarland from the Gay Men's Health Crisis. Oh, hi. Hi, what can I do for you? Yeah, um, I seem to have Kaposi's sarcoma. Hotlines in New York and other cities where the greatest number of people were afflicted began getting about 50 calls a day from worried homosexuals. Today still, the largest number of victims, 75%, are homosexuals, particularly those with many sexual partners. But several other groups have been affected as well. 14% are intravenous drug users. 5% are Haitian immigrants. 1% are hemophiliacs, and 6% fall into none of those categories. 94% of the victims are male. In addition, 20 children have AIDS-like symptoms. And most of the children have had a parent or close family friend who also had the syndrome. Do you have it too? Yeah. They tell me my immune system, my immune cells all go to... So far, 40% of all those who have been afflicted have died. And the Center for Disease Control says that the mortality rate could turn out to be as high as 80%. You just heard a report from ABC News on the evening of December 17, 1982. In this episode, we'll be discussing the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. Five veteran Pan Am employees, David Hinson, Philip Keene, Linda Freer, Becky Sprecher, and Linda Reynolds will be joining us. They will be talking about their experience during this time period and sharing memories of their friends and co-workers that were lost to this terrible disease. This episode provides a unique and intimate look at how an American corporation, Pan American World Airways, navigated the uncertainty of the AIDS crisis and how affected employees were treated. Please keep in mind that some companies during the 1980s did not support their employees during their illness with HIV-AIDS, and those people lost their jobs and health care. Pan Am was not among them, and the airline did everything it could to support their employees during this difficult time. December 1st has been designated World AIDS Day since 1988 and is dedicated to raising awareness of AIDS in the world and warning those who have died of the disease. As of 2021, AIDS has claimed the lives of over 40 million people worldwide since the beginning of the epidemic in the early 1980s. An estimated 37 million are living with HIV today. However, it is important to point out that through the advancement of science, HIV is a manageable disease today with antiviral medications and most with the disease that are on these medications should be able to have normal lifespans with little complications. However, it should be noted 
that HIV is still a serious public health issue in lesser developed nations, and getting medications to these areas can be a challenge for the worldwide healthcare community. In recognition of World AIDS Day, the Pan Am Museum Foundation remembers all the family, friends, and co-workers who died of AIDS. We would like to have a moment of silence on this program to honor them. Before we begin our interviews, I would like to make an editorial comment as the host of this podcast. It is important for all of us to remember the countless people that died of AIDS, and they deserve our respect. Compassion should not be a bad word or ever be interpreted as a weakness, as some political leaders profess today. In fact, compassion is a sign of strength, and compassion for our fellow humans should be a cornerstone of our lives. Compassion for the sick, the poor, the homeless, the less fortunate, the ostracized, the marginalized, should be the bedrock of our lives. I must admit, I am not a particularly religious person, but since some have used religion as a misguided way to hate and treat others with a lack of compassion and respect, I think it appropriate to share a Bible verse in this episode. From John 15, 12, quote, This is my commandment, love each other as I have loved you, end quote. Today is a good day for all of us to take a moment and remember what we're grateful for, hold those special to us close, and remember to cherish every moment because we do not know what tomorrow holds. Take a moment and call an old friend or a lonely neighbor. Send someone you're thinking about an old-fashioned card in the mail. Smile at someone on the street. Sometimes it's the little things that mean the most to people. Much like the AIDS epidemic 40 years ago and the recent COVID-19 pandemic, tomorrow is never guaranteed and our lives can change in an instant. Thank you for listening. Now on to our interview with Linda Reynolds, David Hinson, and Becky Sprecher. Welcome to this special episode of the Pan Am Podcast. Uh, Becky, welcome back. You uh, were featured in episode seven. Linda Reynolds, uh, welcome. Linda is responsible for the library of training videos that we have on our YouTube channel. And the great David Hinson, uh, welcome back. David will be featured in an episode about national airlines. And also David is going through his archives and he is going to be sending the museum some of his training tapes. So we'll have even more of these uh, great training videos. In this episode, we are marking World AIDS Day, and we are going to be talking about the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s uh, at Pan Am. Uh, Becky, why don't we begin with you and talk about uh, when males started becoming flight attendants again? Well, um, the, the brief history of it is that they were hired originally to work on Pan Am's planes. Um, when Juan Tripp was styling the first flying boats uh, back in the um, early early 30s, he um, he styled them in a nautical manner after sort of the great ocean liners and, and using all these nautical themes and vernacular. And that is indeed why the airline industry still uses those terms today. Um, the uh, stewards were working those flights and it fit in, the term steward fit in with kind of the ocean liner theme. Now, TWA and Americans started hiring stewardesses in the 30s and Pan Am was a little late to that. They didn't start hiring their first stewardesses until around 1944 when there was a shortage of men due to uh, World War II. And then by the late 50s and 60s, they were hiring almost exclusively women. And we all know that in the Mad Men era, all of the airlines began marketing the stewardesses. And um, I think that the most difficult or the most odious, I think, of those campaigns, I'm sorry to say, was with, with National Airlines when it was, hi, I'm so-and-so, fly me. <laughs> but those were the days. That's what that's what the mindset was. That was the zeitgeist. 
But with all of this press and all of these uh, kind of um, negative images where the girls were presented as subservient and unintelligent, the term stewardess came to have a negative connotation, even though it's historically more correct. And it kind of ruffled the stewardess's feathers. Um, so they insisted that they wanted to be called flight attendants. And simultaneously, the civil rights era and the women's movement inspired the stewardesses to bring lawsuits that mm. demanded better working conditions and more equal uh, treatment, such as being able to marry and have children without having to give up their jobs. So it wasn't long before the men figured out that they were being discriminated against. And so one of them, uh, Mr. Diaz, uh, decided to bring a suit against Pan Am. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court, correct? Well, um, he it did. And what happened was uh, Mr. Diaz, uh, he won the right to be interviewed by Pan Am. And, uh, you know, it was interesting that the airline argued that a woman's touch was needed to make flying as pleasurable as possible. <laughs> so Mr. Diaz won the right to be interviewed Pan Am, but he was not ultimately hired. The court upheld Pan Am's argument that he did not meet the other criteria that was used for selecting their employees. So at that point, that opened the door and uh, the guys began to apply. And this would have been in March of 1973 when they were coming to Miami for training. So now uh, Pan Am loses in court. Uh, Supreme Court rules that males can now become flight attendants. Unfortunately for Mr. Diaz, um, he won this landmark case, but he was too old um, when it was time for him to interview with Pan Am. So he was never hired. So let's talk about the early 70s and how uh, males coming back to the flight attendant roles uh, kind of changed the industry. Well, yes, it did. And um, I would say made everything much more fun and much more vibrant than it would have been otherwise. I would, I would agree with that. It brought it brought an entirely new element into the cabin, and the the male flight attendants were young and fun. And yeah, I it was such a joy to have them there. Quite frankly, David, when were you hired by National Airlines? Nineteen seventy seven. And why did you want to become a flight attendant? Well, for several reasons. One, um, as a child, I would look up in the sky in my little hometown in Tennessee and see a plane fly over. And I thought, wow, I wonder where that plane's going. And I would love to be on that plane. And I thought, what could I do? And they don't mm -hmm. hire men to be at the time stewardesses. So I thought, what could I do to fly? And sure enough, in 1976, I was studying at the University of Tennessee and I wanted to go on spring break. I went down for an interview with National and they hired me that day and I went to work. And Linda, what was your experience uh, flying as a flight attendant in the 70s, now having to fly with males? Oh, I thought it was great. As I said, I think they brought a whole new level of fun and vibrancy into the cabin. I enjoyed having them around. It, it, they were just fun. And um, just it brought a whole new level of paying attention to certain things. And it turned out that many of them were gay, not all, but many of them were gay. And, and it, it holds true to that, um, uh, that uh, feeling that gays are always so good at design and at putting colors together and at making things look good because, and they did that. I would let them dress me any day. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, honestly, or decorate my house. You know, it was it was <laughs> hilarious. It was absolutely hilarious. But I truly enjoyed so many of the of the male flight attendants that came on board and became good friends with quite a few of them. You know, I'd like to echo what Linda is saying here, because um, these guys, particularly the gay ones, were the best office husband you could you could imagine. They could 
you could go out dancing together. And some parts of the world that we went to, it wasn't safe for for women to go out, you know, by themselves and to have, you know, the guys around and they were good dancers and we could go dancing together. And then the next day you could, they would take you out shopping and tell you what looked good on you and what didn't. Exactly, Um, exactly. It was wonderful. It was like having a really good friend with taste. (laughs) (laughs) And this is, you know, in the early days of the gay rights movement, uh, the Stonewall riots was in June of 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village neighborhood of Lower Manhattan in New York City. And this is in the mid to late 1970s that you're talking about. So it's kind of in the early days of a gay rights movement. That's correct. They were, they found a very tolerant workplace at Pan Am. We were so thrilled that they were there and we all made friends with each other. And because our trips were so long and they involved long night flights, we had a chance to get to know one another on the jump seats. And you'd get into these long conversations about your lives and um, particularly the gay guys, you know, we heard the same story over and over again about how they sensed this when they were growing up and, you know, or at some point and they didn't want to hurt their families. And so they gravitated to the larger cities and, you know, they just didn't have a place. They weren't out in the sunlight. And at Pan Am, they could be. Right. And so it was, it was wonderful for them. And I don't want to ignore the straight guys here, but we are talking about World AIDS Day. So just thought I would add that. And I think that I think that's true. Um, It was a very tolerant workplace. It was one that embraced all types of people. Um, It was very diverse. I mean, not just whether um, it was male or female, but also there was an arousal of awareness of color and that we could embrace people of all different cultures, of all different skin colors. And I think that's one of the things that I most appreciated of Pan Am is that it had such a diverse and interesting workforce. And that's very progressive at this time because some of the other airlines and American corporations were not very inclusive and they were very resistant to a lot of this chain. Yes, I would say that. I think we were global before anybody knew what that was. All three of you made many friends throughout the world and throughout the company. And then the 1980s arrive and this mysterious disease started popping up. Can you, the three of you kind of walk through the early days and the early stories that you started hearing and, you know, perhaps some of the fear that some of your coworkers shared with you uh, during the early days of the epidemic. I'd like to preface that by saying that I, I half the time could not tell, and and being gay was still very much in the closet um, in most circumstances, uh, certainly outside of Pan Am, and half the time I had no idea whether somebody was or was not. I would have to ask my gay friends and, uh, you know, they would educate me. (laughs) It was hilarious, actually. Um, And then when the AIDS epidemic started, um, I think there was a wave of fear that went through the airline uh, because we did have so many gay members. And I think that it, nobody was quite sure how to handle it. I think more than anything else, I don't think we were afraid of being on an airplane with them, sitting next to them, anything like that. I think we were intelligent enough to know a disease that was being passed by other means. And but there were so many people in the in the U.S. and around the world who wouldn't even who couldn't even come within 10 feet of a gay person for fear that somehow they would be contaminated or catch this terrible disease that was going around. And people didn't know how to handle it. And, um, you know, you, you always want to think that you're going to be, you're going to be great at your job. And if there is an emergency and you have to give somebody CPR, for instance, that you would do that. And yet 
there were responders and flight attendants and anybody who um, might encounter an occasion where they might have to use CPR that told me they would walk away. And I thought, how how in the world could you do that to another human being? I, I just don't, I, I just don't get it. Um, and and it was, I think it was just difficult um, for the general population to understand because they had not had that exposure to to gays in general, and it was considered at that time to be a gay disease, and that gave them all the more reason to isolate and ignore what was going on around them or and and to segregate uh, that section of society and um, some of the behaviors that existed in the in the early 80s um, by our fellow human beings are reprehensible in my opinion um, but does that help answer your question yes david not to put you on the spot you've been rather quiet would you like to add something about what it was like living through this time period? Sure. Well, you know, I remember uh, the rumor as it was back then that, um, you know, the first person that they said brought AIDS to the United States was a French Canadian flight attendant. And they, they dubbed that patient, patient zero, because he was the first person known to have AIDS and he's the one who started it. But later through blood work, they found that that was not true. But because that was the rumor going around back then, people just thought that flight attendants were the ones spreading HIV. Right. And uh, which in reality today, and I even thought the same thing back then, because that's all we heard. That was the rumor we heard. And we didn't know any better. And the male flight attendants pretty much knew who was HIV positive and uh, who were trying to take the drugs at the time or, or, or go through this process. And you just accepted that then if they were a friend, which I had many friends that passed away from HIV, and you helped them to get through it the best you could. And I never remember one time Pan Am ever turning on any employee no. that was known to be HIV. Uh, in fact, they did everything everything they could to help that employee. Right. And it helped all the male flight attendants then knowing that if something did happen, uh, you were backed by your company. And there were times even then, if I don't know if you all remember, but then there was a large outbreak of AIDS in, the, in Haiti. And of course, we had a flight that went to Port-au-Prince from Miami and on to Santa Domingo. And I just remember the fear that some of the flight attendants had working those trips and they would wear gloves at the time to pick up all the meal trays, right? which I had not seen until COVID. And so, but then that eased up even. And I just, I don't remember anything that was not, um, that was negative from Pan Am regarding anyone who was HIV, only positive things. We have many of our listeners that are younger and may not understand what transpired during this time period. You mentioned that uh, some of the male flight attendants knew uh, which of their coworkers had HIV and which did not, right. and they were starting to take uh, experimental drugs. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit about that? Well, the gay the gay community among flight attendants was very close. Right. It was a right. close knit. Uh, community. And we hung out together when we weren't working. Uh, everyone knew just about everyone that was a male flight attendant that flew at least at your base, where you were based, and, and probably most all the other bases. And you would just, when someone had gone and gotten tested, they would tell you that they had tested positive, just so you would know, uh, to help protect you as well. And you just sort of, it became sort of like a, a little community of you just knew who was HIV positive and you always thought you were. I went for years thinking, okay, I'm probably HIV positive only because it was a, a gay flight attendant disease is what it was. And you just sort of went through not knowing. And I can remember many times when I'd get off a trip, I would go to my doctor in Miami 
and and get tested. And I would just literally be paranoid waiting on that test to come back, not knowing. But you did that because every time you flew with another male, that say, you know, I had a night sweat last night, or I did this, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I, I had a night sweat too. And you would, it would just be your nerves working you to no end that you just, everyone thought they were going to get um, HIV, become HIV positive. Well, and I think it's important to, um, David, to, to recognize that at that time, if you got AIDS, it was a death sentence. Um, it was and, a death sentence. And so there was, there was... It, the fear was palpable. Um, certainly the awareness of the, within the Pan Am community, the awareness in the gay community was, as you said, they were very tight. They knew each other. Um, they communicated things to each other. And I think, so there was an awareness of, of, of HIV or or this this gay disease, as they called it at the time, um, long before the rest of us really were aware, and they were paying attention and so and communicating with each other, and then we as 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 flight attendants who were not um, members of that community, we gradually became aware of it. The uh, the, the flight attendants, the male flight attendants, shared. Um, their knowledge, their fears, their um, what they were doing for protection. I can remember more than one telling me that it had certainly um, put a kibosh on his lifestyle. So, oh, it did. It, it you you just stopped. Right. You actually literally stopped being gay. Right. Right. And if you want um, to put it that way. And then you know, and I think that. The flight attendants that I know, um, the female flight attendants were supportive and eager to know and eager to help in any way that they could. And how do we, how do we combat? As it finally became known that it was spread through um, through human secretions of one sort or another. Um, as we became aware of these facts, it was how do we communicate this to the world? How do we, how do we make people understand? You look at, uh, and and the majority of the American people had had just not had enough contact with the gay community, had not been close enough to them, had not had the exposure to be able to then embrace and help. Instead, they they blocked them out. They were scared to death. Um, if you look at a young man, not a flight attendant, but if a young man named Ryan White, I just, I, I remember it so well, who was not allowed to go to school. He was a hemophiliac and had contracted AIDS through, um, through a blood transfusion. And there was eventually a community that embraced him, took him in, let him go to school. But he went, you look at what he went through and he became quite an advocate um, for for AIDS. And it, it, it was just heartbreaking, actually, the, the division that it caused within the nation. And um, as, as David said, he lost many friends to AIDS and, and so did I. And it, 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 it's just, it was just heartbreaking until, until they finally started being able to identify the AIDS virus. And that didn't happen until what, 1985. So the virus yeah. showed up in 1981, and there was no test for AIDS until at least 1985. And so, so many, um, so many people were wandering around going, what do I do? I know one flight attendant, a good friend of mine who had mm, had a relationship um, with a with a guy who was actually bi. And so she lived in fear for quite a number of years that she might have contracted it because he eventually did die of the disease. But um, you know, you you have that that underlying fear, and basically all you can do is try to muscle your way through it and um, and come out on the other side. Becky, you have an interesting story that you've you shared with me previously about your brother who was a doctor in New York City when this was first coming to light? Well, he was 
doing a neurology residency at New York Hospital in 1980. He got there, I think. And so it would have been, Linda mentioned, 81. So it was right around in that time frame when uh, he said, you know, I was talking to him on the phone and he said, you know, there's this terrible new disease that we're seeing and, you know, it's absolutely fatal. And we're seeing it um, in the population of intravenous drug users and the gay and gay men. And, um, you know, it's we call it the wrath of God. Now, that, that he wasn't saying that to be judgmental um, because as if those people were being punished for their behaviors, but the scientific and medical community um, couldn't figure it out. You know, it was severe. It, there was a total lack of understanding about its origins and transmissions, and there was no treatment that uh, existed. So, um, you know, this was a very, very difficult and tragic uh, situation that started developing. And and then I noticed I had let, quit flying in 1977, but I still had my friends and they were starting to get sick. David, I want to zero in on something that you mentioned. You mentioned going to get tested. Mm -hmm. uh, today, with the, the advancement of science, HIV tests are less than 20 minutes. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, when I was younger, uh, right. you had to wait two weeks and you had to go in and get your blood drawn and then come back in two weeks. And you didn't know in that two week period, you know, what was going to be the result. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the early tests that you mentioned and almost the trauma around it and the, the emotions around that waiting period of not knowing whether or not you have this or not? Well, you know, the first actually, uh, Linda was correct. The first actually screening for HIV didn't come around until like 1985. And I can remember going to, I remember his name, Dr. Feldman, and I would go in and ask to be tested for, um, get an HIV test. And I would have to make myself go. I was so paranoid about it. And I would go and they would do the test. And then you had to wait on them to call you to come back. And they would not tell you the results over the phone. You had to go into the office for them to talk with you. And because they would talk to you, if you were negative, they would talk to you about your habits and what, what habits you need to change if you're still participating in any of those things. And then of course, if you were positive, it was different. And I can very much remember walking into the waiting room at the doctor's office because they had called me to come back. And the whole time I'm walking there, I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is it. I can accept whatever they tell me. You know, I've had a good life, blah, 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 blah. And I would go in and I remember the lady, the receptionist, and uh, I sat down in the chair and she looked at me and she could tell I was just about to pass out probably. And she winked at me. And when she winked at me, I knew it was okay. And I can remember that just as well as I could just see her doing it right now today. And I can remember what she looked like. She winked at me and sure enough, I was negative. And after that, I had many more tests and you went through the same horror as you did on any of those tests. And I still get tested with my physical every year now. Even today, I get tested for HIV. It's just part of my physical. And while I don't worry about it like I did then, uh, it's still in the back of your mind until the doctor calls or you get your test results. Now you get them in an email and you can see it yourself. So it was, it was traumatic for any male to go and get tested. And then, of course, if it was positive, then it was a whole different story. Right. Linda, um, recently, uh, you and I worked on this training video project on YouTube. Right. And um, I, I honestly, I was not expecting this. Uh, but during our conversations and going through the videos together, um, you mentioned a, a few of the people that you worked closely with uh, that passed away from AIDS. And I didn't realize how much of an impact, you know, 30 years later, me, you know, viewing these videos with you um, and these beautiful young men that, um, you know, would only die, you know, maybe a year or two after this video was was shot. 
um, and it, it it really struck me. Um, is there anything you want to talk about about uh, some of the individuals that you knew and worked with uh, mm -hmm. that died of this terrible disease? It's heartbreaking. Sorry. Um, it, it still affects me. Um, and I, I think back to, you know, if, if we had, if we had known more, you know, it was all at that time, it was all so new. Nobody knew what caused it, particularly at the beginning. There wasn't enough, uh, there wasn't enough money poured into research. Um, political things got in the way, cultural things got in the way. It was a, a, a gay man's disease. And so it was in many regards, I, I don't want to say it was ignored, but it wasn't highly funded, really, I think, until it ultimately got into the blood supply. And then it started affecting other people. And then there were there were women that started uh, getting it as well. And, and only then when it became uh, more present in the general population, did it get the attention that it wanted. Um, and I, I just, I look back and I, I, I think it's just such a waste of, of, of lives that, um, all of this had to happen. And I don't think that, I think that if funding had been started sooner, it would have saved more lives. It perhaps would have protected us better, but, you know, there's, there's no telling, um, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Um, but I do, I, I do, I, I get sad um, when I think about the lives that were lost and it, it just seems so, so horrible. And I think that um, there's just a, in our country today, there's still a division um, between those who, those who think that it is fine to accept gays and, and, and all stripes of people, quite frankly, and those in our society who abhor the idea. And, um, and, and I just, I, I don't have a lot of tolerance for that, quite frankly. Um, and, and I'm very vocal about it. So uh, this is not this is not a choice that people make. It's not something that they go, oh, gee, I think I want to be gay. This is not a choice. And I, people just, so many people in our society do not understand that at all. I, I, I talk to so many of the, the flight attendants whose families um, disown them. Uh, you know, how, how could you, how could you as a parent disown your child? I, I, I'll never get it. I, I will never get it. I think it's just one of the saddest things in the world. Hey, Linda. Hey. I have a a, a, a photograph. There was, a, you know, in the 80s, people still were sort of shocked to see males on airplanes. Believe it or not, you might get one male flight attendant with a whole crew of females. And they say, wow, there's a male flight attendant. Well, I worked several 747 flights where the entire crew was male. And wow. I have a picture of 12 of us all together. And today there are two of us left with all the others dying of AIDS. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, and it was, I look yeah. at that picture a lot and I think, you know, why, why did I live? Why didn't I get it? And it's just, um, it hurts to go back and look at that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was, it was, it was, it was hard. It was just hard um, and just hard. Becky, what's your perspective? You stopped flying in 1977, but you had lifelong friends uh, to this day and made many friends that you had that, uh, died of AIDS in the 80s. What what would you like to add to this discussion? Well, um, I am very moved by David and Linda's comments. And uh, when I, I just think of all the 
the talent that we missed out on, you know, because these people didn't survive. And uh, I just think about how much I learned from them. And um, I, I think we all remember at Pan Am the, the Mark Twain quote, you know, that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. And broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all of one's lifetime. And I, I think that just reflects the attitude at Pan Am when I said traveling the world with these people and having them as my friends um, enrich my life immeasurably. And I can only wish that more of them were still here. David, let's talk a little bit about being a gay man growing up in the South, joining National Airlines and then uh, joining Pan Am when the merger happened. A lot of our listeners may not understand the challenges that you've gone through that now, um, I mean, we've certainly turned a corner, yet there are some future challenges that we're struggling with as a society, both politically and in schools and so forth. But you're already working on the challenge of acceptance of being a gay man. And then all of a sudden, this health crisis where you're being ostracized by some in the public, how did you cope with all of that? And I kind of want you to speak to the younger people that may be listening that don't have to go through what you went through. Well, I left my hometown so that I could be myself. I didn't feel like I could be myself where I was living. And I had not accepted the fact that I was gay. And that was the hardest thing was saying, okay, I need to go someplace where I'm away from my family and my friends that know me for who they think I am. And so that's why I chose to go with the airlines, because the perception was that, you know, there were gay people flying. And so I chose that field and I'm glad I did. And I, as time went on, I had very supportive parents and supportive friends that accepted me for who I was, which was not always the case with some of my friends. And the, the challenge was finally just coming out to myself that it's okay to be who you are. And don't be ashamed of who you are and to make your life based on who you are. And that's what I did. And I don't worry anymore if people know I'm gay. Uh, as far as working with the airline, I can't think of one incident, even when AIDS was so prevalent. I can't think of one time that any passenger or any other crew member did anything to make me feel like I wasn't who I was. I think I've been very lucky. Uh, I've had no one say, don't serve me because you're gay. I've had no passengers that looked at me and said, I don't want to be served by you. So I feel like that I've been lucky, Tom, in that I've been able to live my life who I am and I accept who I am. And it goes back to what I think Becky or, or Linda once said, I didn't choose this. If I had chosen what I'd really like to be, I would like to have been straight and had children. But it just didn't turn out that way. And um, but I'm OK with who I am now. I've got a wonderful partner and um, life goes on. I've heard many stories um, where crew members were surprised, especially with the flight crew. Um, most of these gentlemen that were pilots. Uh, came from a military background and were very conservative. And I hear hear this pop up many times do, when we when I talk about the 80s and the AIDS epidemic kind of pops up, where you would assume that the captain and the first officer and the flight engineer would have a problem and would not would be unsympathetic to people that were going through the, the the terrible disease, but 
they were pleasantly surprised that there was compassion and they were wrong in assuming that a lot of these very conservative gentlemen um, really cared and were moved by what was going on. Anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll jump right in there because I think it, it just points out what Becky said before. Travel is the basically travel is the great equalizer. And if you're not exposed to different uh, people of different races, people of different sexual orientation, uh, any of those things, then all you know is the circle around you and everything else is scary. Whereas at Pan Am, we knew each other. We had exposure to everything, all these different cultures, um, all these different orientations of, of how people thought, how they acted. It was, it was an awakening if you, like me, just stepped into, um, if you stepped into the big wide world from a little Midwest town. So I think that because the pilots and all the flight attendants and the passengers were more well-traveled, had more exposure to all of these different things. And in the, in the uh, community of Pan Am employees, we knew each other. So I think that acceptance came right along with the, the fact that you had come to know these people as your friends. And that's true, Linda. I, I can say probably more cockpit crew members would ask me to go hang out and have a beer on a layover than anybody. They were, I, I can't think of one that did not, that I did not enjoy working with. In yeah. the cockpit. I think, I think, I think as, as a very general rule, that is absolutely true. I, as in any, as in any society, any group, you're always going to have those that don't fit into that. And there were a few. Well, and it also or, depends on your approach. Are in the minority. Well. Yes. And it, it depends on your approach as well. Exactly. Exactly. One of the things that has amazed me is the sense of family in the Pan Am community. And I would like to ask the three of you, how did that family cope with the loss of many of its members due to HIV AIDS? Who said anything about coping? <laughs> I don't think I, I don't, I still don't think I've coped with it very well. It's hard. Well, I think we coped with it just like you cope with other illnesses and other deaths with your friends. Um, you got together and you mourned and you, um, I must say, some of the funerals I went to were extraordinary. You had artists who painted pictures of the loved one who'd passed away. You had these guys would get together and cater the food. You had singers who would sing these gorgeous oratories in the church. Uh, just, you know, it was just such a a very uh, a poignant time, you know. The problem I had coping with it, and it was coping with it at the time, was you would go to a memorial service and you would see all your friends there and you wondered who would be next. Yes, yes. That's what yes. I coped with the worst, I think, was going to a memorial service and you see all your friends there and you look around and you think, okay, which one of us is next? Yep. Because there was going to be a next at the time. You just didn't know who. Yeah, it was tough. Anything you'd like to add about this time period and this topic that you think that future generations should remember and know about? That you'll get through it. Yeah. You're strong enough to get through it. Uh, I think that um we all are presented with obstacles throughout our life and you have to make choices and the choices you make will determine the outcome 
And I think as the song says, you got to have friends to get through anything. You've got to have a family of friends. And we had that at Pan Am. We did. We did. Still do. Pan Am is still, as you said, Tom, Pan Am is still family. Anytime you run across somebody and you know they flew for Pan Am or worked for Pan Am, even though you didn't know them, they're family. And I don't like to use that word, you know, loosely like that, but it's true. Anybody you come across it's Pan Am, that you have a you have a connection right away. I think so much of it is because we were adventurous. We were pioneers in so many regards. We and we relied on each other. Um, we flew to some of the most remote places on Earth. We had no support really. Um, we. we couldn't call Chicago or or New York or wherever um, to solve our problems. We had to solve them ourselves. And we worked as a team with not only the, the crew members, but also the people on the ground staff and the mechanics and everybody worked together um, to successfully resolve any kind of problem that arose. And, and we became a very cohesive team all, all across the world. And if you went anywhere where there was a Pan Am station, you know that you knew that you could go in there and you could ask for help in with anything. Um, uh, you know, help me figure out where I should stay. Help me figure out how to get on a train. Whatever it took, the Pan Am family was there to support and guide you. And, um, and we would do the same for any of them. Anything else you'd like to add to our conversation? No, but you've upset me today. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on <laughs> my second Kleenex. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean it to. Brought, it bring, it, Tom, it brings back a lot, a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a long time since the 70s and the 80s, believe it or not. And it just brings back a lot of emotions that sort of had been pushed way back in um, the back of my mind. And then I think about all my friends that I had and it just brings back a lot of memories. So, but that's good. It's okay to, to feel this way. Yeah. It's kind of, it, it kind of opens up that hole in your heart, doesn't it, David? It does. It just brings back a time in our life that, you can't forget and you never will forget, you know, no. and we won't forget them. The ones no. we lost, we don't, we no, always will never. remember them. No. And it's certainly courageous for the three of you to share your stories. Uh, after a quick break, we're going to be joined by Linda Frere and Philip Keen, and they're going to share their stories as well. But it's important to document these stories for people to know what it was like living through this period and for them to know um, all these wonderful people that you knew that uh, were victims of this terrible disease. So I would like to thank all three of you for, for joining me on the program. I know it's a difficult topic. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Tom. That's and Tom. Linda thank and you. Becky. Thank you. We are going to take a quick break before our next interview with Linda Freyer and Philip Keene with the song Time After Time by Cindy Lauper, sung by Kevin Ryder of Forte Toronto Gay Men's Chorus. <laughs> Lying in my bed, I hear the clock tick and I think of you Caught up in circles, confusion is nothing new Flashback, warm nights, almost left behind Suitcase of memories Time after sometimes you picture me 
I'm walking too far ahead. You're calling to me. I can't hear what you said. And you say, go slow. I fall behind. The second hand unwinds. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. Time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting. Time after time. After my picture fades and darkness has turned to gray, watching through windows. You're wondering if I am okay. Secrets stolen from deep inside. The drum beats out of time. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. Time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting. Time after time. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting time after time. You say, go slow, I fall behind. The second hand unwinds. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting time after time. If you fall, you can look and you will find me time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I will be waiting. Time after time, time after time, time after time, time after time, time after. Welcome back to the program. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next two interviewees. Uh, Linda Freer is the board chair of the Pan Am Museum Foundation, and Philip Keene is a board member of that same organization. Uh, I serve with both of them on the board, and we are going to hear from them about their experiences of the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s. Welcome back, both of you, to the program. You've both been on previous episodes. Linda, why don't we start with you? Tell us about what it was like to work uh, for Pan Am in the 1980s when this terrible disease was becoming evident that it was uh, an epidemic. Uh, yeah. Um, going back in time, it's kind of difficult to remember or trace back exactly when we first started noticing an increase of illness in um some of the male flight attendants, uh, but it almost seemed like out of nowhere, it just hit us with a force. And I was a, a supervisor at the time uh, when this all started happening. And one of my very, very good friends was a flight attendant who was in the office with me and his name was Michael Silber. And many Pan Am flight attendants will remember Michael and his partner, Barry. Um, Michael and Barry both passed with during the AIDS epidemic. It's hard. It's hard to uh, talk about this because they were so close. We were so close. Um, but I can tell you, at the beginning, people weren't sure what to make of it. There was fear, uh, but there was also understanding and a desire to try to, which was pretty Pan Amish. How do we fix it? How do we make it better? How do we get these people healthy? What do we do? How do we love them more? 
How do we care for them? So the company took a position um, that this was an illness like any other illness. And um, people were granted leaves and um, uh, the treatment was was enabled, you know, through um, insurance provided by the company. But other flight attendants were scared and um, some did things that were difficult to understand. Um, I was on a flight and I remember one flight attendant putting on plastic gloves and to serve in the aisle. And I remember saying, you, you, you can't, don't do that. Don't do that. Cause it makes other people, whether they be passengers or crew feel bad, or if there's something wrong with them. Fortunately for us, that was the exception more than the rule. But overall, all we wanted to do as a group, as a team, as a company, was find a way to make them better. My friend Michael, um, who was in the office with me, he knew at some point in his struggle that there wasn't going to be a good outcome. And so um, after he lost his partner, Barry, he was somewhat resigned to what was inevitable. And I think those of us that were close with him didn't want him to accept that. We wanted to keep fighting. But he would do things um, because, and to this day, I still have many of the things that he he gifted me. He would go to, um, he went to Honolulu on a trip and he um, he knew I loved the birds of paradise flowers. So one day I received this huge bouquet of, of birds of paradise. And another time he was at the christening. My son was born in 1990. And Michael was there. <clears throat> Fortunately, medication did help him last longer and stay with us longer. And he, um, he said to me, I want your son to know me because I won't be here. And he uh, he gave me a red flyer wagon so that when I would take Jonathan out for a walk, Michael would be with us. And I still have that red flyer wagon. He gave me things that were, uh, you know, I can't. Things from his trips to Africa, things from that were of special significance and importance to him. Treasured memories that will be with me forever. We all hurt immensely. Because there were so many. And we saw them go through this terrible, torturous disease. Of, and and. We were incapable at that time of helping them. Philip, why don't you share us your perspective and your story? Well, when I was hired in 19, when I first started in, in 88, um, I was well aware of what was going on uh, in our community. Uh, initially, when, when I first heard of it, it was called GRID, um, Gay-Related Immunodeficiency Disease. Uh, which was the acronym given and the name given by Dr. Michael Gottlieb, um, who is actually a, a friend now. Uh, so I was I was aware of what was going on and was terrified of it, like a lot of people. I didn't know how it was spread, how to keep myself safe. Um, but through reading and trying to get the information that I could, um, I felt I'd armed myself as best I could and um, was terrified to let anyone know uh, when I was applying for this job, initially, even that I, that I was gay, because I thought that would disqualify me from, from being hired. I, I didn't realize what a welcoming place it was going to be. Uh, so, I, so I was a little scared of that. Um, but I, I never encountered any, um, never really met anybody that, that I worked with that, that was 
ill. It was badly ill. I mean, I had known people before uh, I was hired that there was nothing the doctors could do for them. They were uh, either evicted from their apartments or rejected by their families, told that this was God's judgment. Uh, even some of the physicians would tell them tell them that. Um, so it was a hard place to be. And I, I wanted this job so desperately that I, that I tried to hide everything that I could about myself. And I uh, didn't want this to be part of who I was. Uh, but like I said, I, I joined the company and I was fully embraced and felt uh, a part of it. And um, there, there were colleagues I, I knew who, who were positive. Um, so I've, I've managed to come through this whole, whole thing um, with a little bit of survivor's guilt, I, I, I have to say. Uh, wondering along the lines of David Hinson that why everyone else and not me, um, but that but that's where I am today, and uh, I, I think that's all I can say about that for, for at this moment. Linda, let's go back to your friend and how Pan Am is a American corporation uh, treated their employees because during this time period. There were other American corporations, unfortunately, that did not take care of their employees. And those employees were either fired or ostracized or both. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how Pan Am was different? And also tell us a little bit about your friends. Sure. Um, And Michael, like I said, was a supervisor in the office and he remained working. He was right along beside us throughout most of his journey until he'd become too ill to actually come into the office. Um, I saw him go through pretty much most of the phases of the disease in in the 80s. Uh, But the company, like I said before, was very understanding. And um, I'm not sure if the word is loyal, supportive, wanting to be there for the employee because the employee had been there for us as a company. Um, So uh, people were allowed to use their sick time. And and in those days, there was a a very generous um, sick policy. They were allowed to use their sick policy as long as they were able to fly. If they weren't able to fly, then, of course, they were given access to, to disability. Never treated as a pariah and or some of the things that Philip had mentioned, um, none of that. It was it was always, at least to my knowledge, if some of that occurred in, in other areas of the company, I was unaware. But I can tell you in New York, that's not how we handled any of it. Everybody was dealt with compassion and understanding and care and concern. Um, and I and I don't know how other companies handled it, but this was a family. This was our pain and family. And they were hurting. That's how I always felt with the company. No matter what was going on with us, we always, the company always had our back. Our friends always had our back. So that's definitely my experience too, Linda. Yeah. Uh, You know, these were our friends and colleagues, and especially those of us who were in in-flight service management. You know, we, we flew with these people. We were all line flight attendants at one point or another. And so we knew these people, you know, from sitting on jump seats with them and from going to their houses and enjoying their company. And Michael was was just a wonderful human being. I, I don't have enough words to describe the kind of generous spirit that he was. But he was and he was a great flight attendant. He just meticulous in everything he did, um, you know, wanting to set up, you know, the 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 uh, flight um, with every attention to detail, the incredible attention to detail. And, uh, you know, he, he, he took pride in what he did and everything that he did, no matter how he did it, he took pride in uh, that's in his service delivery on board the aircraft. And he was the same as a supervisor for an in-flight service. Um, Because he came off the line, he was very attentive to um, whatever needs of the flight attendants there were that we had to address or if there was, you know, corrective action that had to be taken, 
And I think it was that sense of pride that he had in what he did for a living and then in the job that um that he had such a such professionalism in service delivery and in the office. He was always, no matter how sick he was, he was always professional and he was always well dressed. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, you know, with those gifts he gave me um, when he was not able to come into the office anymore and some of the trips he took, it's just a reflection of his heart. He had a heart as big as the. <laughs> global root structure of Pan Am. Um, he was a special person and uh, I, 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 you, you don't always meet those kinds of people in your life. And I was blessed to have known him um, as I know most of the people who knew him felt the same way at the time. Philip, many of our listeners um, are younger and the purpose of this episode is not only for the people that that lived it um, in this time period, but also for younger people that are trying to understand what it was like to live in the 1980s, uh, especially as a gay man. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight on how it was like to live during this time period? Yeah, um, th there were there were places for us to, as groups to go. There were um, what, I, what we jokingly refer to as we, we called them ghettos, gay ghettos, <laughs> uh, where we, we we could gather safely in, in bars and clubs and things like that. But there were always incidents uh, that you would hear about where a group of people would come into, let's say, West Hollywood or something, and go gay bashing. Uh, so these would be uh, young guys, mostly. Uh, sometimes armed with baseball bats or, 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 you know, two by fours and just they go into a gay area and just get out of the car and start bashing people at random. So, you know, even in those areas, we weren't always safe, although we, we felt that we were. Um, and then when HIV AIDS crisis uh, loomed its, its head, there, there was really nothing anyone could do. Um, there was no medication that was, in, in, in the very beginning to, to help anybody. People were ostracized, uh, families disowned their children. Um, oftentimes people were put out onto the street in, in New York with all of their belongings and possessions, sick as a dog, uh, covered in Kaposi sarcoma and barely able to move and landlords kicking them out because they didn't want them in their apartments anymore. Uh, not being able to go into restaurants because people didn't want you in there. Uh, no one wanting to touch you. Uh, it, it, when you were in the hospital, uh, nurses and doctors covered completely from head to toe. Um, and honestly, some of these people I think should have known better, especially the medical profession, even if they weren't sure um, what, what exactly what was going on. I mean, there's some basics to understand about how viruses were spread, um, especially with this one anyway. The, and it was just, it was terrifying because not only had they been abandoned by their friends and family, but they were abandoned by the people who were supposed to be able to take care of them in, in, in the medical field. Um, and, and nowadays, the younger generation may have heard of this. They may have uh, known someone who may have passed it recently because of other complications, but they'll never see what we saw, the wasting of people, the desperation, the, the hollow look on people's faces, the... the you, not that they should have to see that, but it was not an easy thing to go through. It just, it, it just, it wasn't. Linda, would you like to give your perspective? Um, it, it, it was, it was such a, a kind of a mixed emotions of feelings going through that, that time um, because you we were fighting for so many things in the eighties. We were fighting for our friends to survive. We were fighting for the company to survive, especially the late eighties when things were um, looking really bad. So our, you know, we just kept digging in and trying to work harder and harder and do whatever we could um, to attend to the needs of, of our, of our friends. I mean, I, I wasn't, obviously aware. I know Michael used to 
Michael lived in Brooklyn and one of his favorite places to go was the Brooklyn Bot Botanical Gardens. And we used to, I used to meet him and we'd just walk through the gardens and he would always feel, he said he could feel safe there. It was outside and there was a sense of beauty. And, um, and, and that gave him a sense of peace um, because th the rest of the time I know in other aspects of his life um, was not very easy. Um, all the particulars I'm, I'm not, a, either I, I wasn't privy to or I, I don't remember that as well because the overwhelming emotion was about how do we help them, him, survive How, what do we do what you know we didn't have the internet then we didn't have google we didn't have medical professionals who were as knowledgeable and able to, they didn't have the drugs and the medications it was very much day to day and we lived day to day to day just trying and hoping a cure a remedy something would be out there or on the horizon to get them to get michael through another day, another month, another year. Um, you know, the fact that when I look back on the pictures of my son when he was christened in 1990, um, I, I, you know, when I see him in our pictures, I'm just reminded of the struggle and the fact that I was so happy he was still with us for that occasion. Early in the program, David Hinson was talking about there was a flight that they took a picture of the flight crew. It was almost an entirely male uh, 747 flight attendant. And in this picture that David was talking about, um, only two are alive today. And it got me thinking that, you know, the gay community lost almost an entire generation uh, during the AIDS epidemic. Philip, would you like to uh, give us a little bit more insight on that? Yeah. Um, as far as the, the photograph goes, I mean, I have a, an address book uh, from the 80s where I would say a good third of the entries are, are, are blacked out because they're, they're no longer with us. Um, I lost, I've lost a, a number of partners over the years, um, and one that was very telling to me, uh, his mother never really accepted the fact that uh, he was gay and that, that he and I were together, she somehow blamed me for him being gay and then for him getting sick, which happened well after we'd broken up. But as I attended his funeral, his mother came up to me and asked me a question. She asked me um, if I'd learned anything from this. And I just looked at her and I said, yes, I have. I, I have. And I think she knew exactly what I meant by that. It was that it's people like her, her attitude and her fear made his life a lot worse when it could have been a lot better. Uh, he was so ill, he had to quit work. Um, he lost his job, couldn't get another one. So he was reluctantly welcomed back home where his mother made him sleep on disposable sheets, plastic cutlery and paper plates, made him take his clothing out to the laundromat. And this is how she treated her son, who she claimed to love. Oh. Um, the doctor at the hospital where I went to see him for the last time, agreed with his mother and said, this in fact was God's punishment for his lifestyle choices. So time and time again, this is what I came up against um, in whenever any of my friends or exes had um, come down with this, this horrible thing. And this is how they were treated. So I was fearful of first of contracting it, um, and I, I just assumed that anyone that I met had it and, you know, would act accordingly. So uh, it was just, it was a very negative experience on, on that end of it. I remember once on a, on a flight, this only ha ever happened one time. Um, I was on a, a, a smaller aircraft with another male flight attendant and one other, uh, there was a female flight attendant as well. And the pilot came out of the cockpit walking down the aisle and addressed the female flight attendant by her name and then turned to us and asked us, said, and how are you two, two sword swallowers doing today? <gasps> and I just felt as though this, there was no, I had no, I had no way to 
react to that other than shock. I mean, I, I couldn't say anything to him because he was in charge of, you know, the plane, he was the captain. Um, and so it, it just kind of put me in my, in, in a place where I felt helpless. <laughs> it, 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 like a lot of us did at that time with, with what was going on. Uh, we were desperately searching for answers and compassion and just human kindness. And, and most of the time we would get that, but on those rare occasions when it didn't happen, I think it hurt more than it probably would have otherwise. Um, I think I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, Tom, as I want to do. So any redirection in this uh, area would help. <laughs> no, I, I think that, uh, I mean, the reason why we're doing this it is not for us, it's for future generations that may be listening to this and trying to understand mm -hmm. what it was like in the 1980s yeah. um, through the brilliance of science and medicine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, HIV today is a manageable disease. Uh, and... Yes, it is. And it wasn't back then. There were no medications. And the few medications no. in the very beginning that there were made people desperately sick. And, and, and even up until, you know, the nineties, there was, a, there were a lot of things that sometimes the medications were worse than yes. you know, yes. the, the initial disease itself. I mean, the side effects alone were, were almost crippling. I remember a, a friend having to do uh, at-home chemotherapy. There was a version of it that would to, to help produce more white blood cells, and it was as though he had severe flu for uh, you know six days, and then he would have one day off, would feel better, and then would have to start this again. And I mean, it was it was horrifying just just to see what was going on. Yeah, it was a torturous process that they went through, and. I mean, I'm 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 taken aback when I hear the stories that Philip says because the 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 nucleus, the family that I was associated with at the time, was anything but that. So when you hear these stories, and I know they existed, I'm not I'm not um, you know immune to knowing that they existed. They did. I know they existed, and the bigotry and the and the horrible comments, um, but that wasn't. The group of people with whom I was working with and with whom I associated, and that wasn't how we treated anybody um, that was afflicted with this terrible, terrible, horrible disease. And it was it was a terrible time to see people you loved and cared about so tortured by this disease. It it was terrible, and you just had to go one day at a time and hope that the medicine, that a cure was around the corner. Unfortunately for my friend, Michael, it didn't come fast enough. Um, but the good news is today, yes, medication has rendered it very, you can live with it, obviously, um, and thrive with it. So, I mean, it's a, it's a different world we live in today, but the early- It's no longer a death sentence. Yeah. No longer a death sentence. And, but the early days of, Dealing with it not only as an airline, as a community, if you will, but as a society. I mean, there were, you know, people were afraid. They were scared. They they kind of treated some people like pariahs. It was it was the unknown, and um, there was all kinds of fake, uh, misunderstand, misunderstood uh, sentiments about the disease. Um, medicine it was kind of like the early days of the pandemic people didn't really know what to expect or how to how to deal with it and so fear did take hold of a lot of people but i'm happy to say within our little community we just use love and care and concern yeah yeah what message do you have for people that might be listening that did not grow up in the 80s that did not have a personal connection to what was going on Philip, why don't we start with you? Message. Huh. Um, wow. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of a message I, I would have to for them, except that when confronted with something that you're not sure about, gather all the facts that you possibly can and remember to use exercise, compassion, and love, because those are the things that will always get us through this. I think that's as, as much as I can say. 
Linda, how about you? I I, I think um, as with anything, um, whether it was the AIDS epidemic or the pandemic, um, use um, intelligence and compassion and concern. Use love as the guide. Um, you know, the, fear is a is a contagious thing as well, and it can overtake people's um, understanding and comprehension of re the real issues. And when I think back to all all the crazy things that came out um, regarding those who were afflicted with this terrible disease, they were so wrong. And, and, and it was more instilled with um, fear of the unknown. But if we used, I mean, I think one of the, the biggest lessons we learned too was when Arthur Ashe, the famous tennis player, became sick. And he had gotten sick through a blood transfusion um, and subsequently died, unfortunately. Um, but here was a man of incredible talent and um, and grace in the face of his um, in face of contracting this disease. Uh, but but he still used love and understanding to deal with the people um, with whom he came in contact. And I, I think that's the message we just have to come from a position of compassion and understanding and not fear and judgment. Um, I agree more. Yeah. And there were so many people in the, there were a lot of people in the beginning who really championed this cause. Elizabeth Taylor, Morgan Fairchild, yes. Yes. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, even Hillary Clinton and in, in, in all of this, there, there were so many women of uh, positions of power who stood up and, made noise and demanded resources and help and understanding and, and communication. And I, I, I've, I can say that I've, I'm proud to, to have met three of those women and have thanked them for their contributions to making this disease not as bad as it, as it, as it was. Yeah. Yeah. They stood up in the face of a lot of, um, uh, controversy and a lot of anxiety, anxiousness in the country and said, no, we will fight for these people and we will fight to get the money for research and we will pour love and intelligence and research and science, science into yes. understanding and treating this horrible disease. And, um, and they made a difference, obviously. Yes. Well, thank you both for coming back onto the program. I know it's a difficult topic, uh, but it's an important topic. Uh, it's important for people to know what you lived in the 80s. Um, and it's important to remember all of the friends, family, and coworkers that were lost to this terrible disease. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for doing this episode. It is important um, that we remember. Thank you, Tom, for letting us letting us share our experiences with this so that hopefully younger people will be able to understand what it was really like. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe people's attitudes will change in the future about, about these kinds of things. And like Linda said, not to be governed by, by fear, but to, to be led by love and compassion. Thank you both. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. We're going to end this episode with the song No Day But Today by Jonathan Larson from the musical Rent, sung by Paul Healy. Again, thank you for listening.
there's only us only tonight we must let go to know what's right no other road no other way no day but today i can't control my destiny I trust my soul My only goal Is just to be There's only now There's only here Give in to love Or live in fear No other path No other way No day but today There's only us There's only this Forget regret All life is yours to miss No other road No other way No day but today No day but today No day but today No day but today No day